Um, obviously, Tony told us a little bit about your background. Eclectic is one way to describe it. Accomplished is another because when you were 14, Bonnie, you made a list of five goals that you wanted to accomplish. And as it relates to your current role at JetBlue, one of them was to be a pilot, and you are. Um, talk a little bit about how that came to be. Sure. So I uh, kind of all leads together. I wrote this list of five things. One was to go to good college. So uh, Stanford. So check. I went to check. Go into Stanford uh, and to work uh, in um, television. And uh, I also wanted to be in the Olympics. It happened to be an Olympic year. So I, I said, I want to be in the Olympics. And then what do Olympic athletes do? They work in television. So uh, I actually majored in broadcast journalism. And at that time, then I also. Um, got involved in the sport of luge. Uh, as a, I was a torchbearer to Lake Placid, and then saw luge and said, oh, that looks like fun. That's how I got started there. Once I got involved in luge, after doing it several times, I was in television, uh, working at KGO TV in San Francisco, the evening news, doing sports, and I met the weathermen. The weathermen, in many, uh, uh, are often pilots, because you have to understand the weather, and he was telling me about learning how to fly, and he said, just go to the airport. Wait, how old were you at this time? 25, maybe, 24, 25. And this is my message to anyone who's ever wanted to learn to fly. Just go to the local airport, one of the general aviation airports, and take three lessons. That's not too high of a hurdle, just three lessons. Once you do that, you can see if you want to do. So that's what he told me to do. Take three lessons. I did, and well, the rest is history, so here I am. That's a pretty incredible <laughs> history. Um, well, we'll try to sleep took a lot more than three lessons to get here. Yes. But <laughs> and now you're started. president of JetBlue Technology Ventures, which we'll get to shortly. But I want to bring in Robin here because, Robin, you're an engineer by training. Mm -hmm. You're kind of a transportation nut. You've always liked transportation. Mm -hmm. You say you like things that work and move. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to, you want to get into the train industry. You ended up in airlines instead. How did that yeah, happen? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, set my I set myself some goals as well. Uh, like Bonnie, but unfortunately, I didn't achieve any of mine. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, one was to uh, you know, one was to um, invite out the uh, girl that I had a crush on, but she said no. One was to get in the <laughs> school football team, and I didn't ever get in. Uh, and the third one was to get a job in the train industry, and I didn't even manage that. So uh, <laughs> there's definitely help also if you don't achieve any of your goals. But uh, no, I mean, I, I grew up in London, and uh, you know, I was fascinated by trains. I think a lot of young kids are, you know. And it was to me back then, it was much more accessible than aviation. I didn't actually take my first flight till I was 18. Can you can you believe? Uh, yeah. So it's just a lines mm -hmm. just came to me a, a little bit later. But they're pretty. Airplanes are pretty cool too. So. Yeah, you worked yeah. at an airport, right? Well, I did. I mean, um, I actually, uh, when I finished college, I did manage to just about graduate. And um, <laughs> I uh, got a summer job in Boston. I went to school in England, but I got a summer job in Boston working the Judy Free store. And uh, it's ironically, it was Terminal C, for those of you who know Boston, which yeah. back then was Delta and TWA, and now is JetBlue. So ah. it was weird that yeah. I'm in this Judy Free store, and it's now Legal Seafoods, by the way. And I'm, I'm <laughs> and I'm handing out the duty free, uh, and I didn't even, you know, I didn't even. I had one goal there, which was to not go sick for my entire summer job because you got a fifty dollar bonus, and I was sick on my last day, oh. and so I didn't even get that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so both of you had worked at airlines previously. Bonnie, you flew for United, mm -hmm. and Robin, you were obviously at British Airways. What do you think is the biggest difference between JetBlue and? the legacy carriers that you worked for? I think that, first of all, the entire industry is filled with wonderful people, really, really good people. Um, and so I think at JetBlue, it's not only the great people, but it's really the whole system is set up to support the, the great people. And it's, it's the culture is amazing. Um, and uh, I truly believe that there's a right company for everyone. I believe that the right company for me was the was JetBlue, and it, it is around the people, and and it's it's pretty amazing. I, I remember the the first day uh, an orientation, and our, our then CEO um, David Nealman was there, and our COO uh, Dave Barger, and they welcomed all the new hires. And here we are, it was 15 years later, and Robin goes down and welcomes the new hires. Mm -hmm. it, it, I I had been at United for well, I was there for 13 years, and I think I met the CEO once. That's notable. Robin? 
I, you know, I think the biggest difference is when you work for, I mean, I had a, I love beer. I had a great career. Uh, and, um, but I think when you work for large legacy like that, where you've got very, an incumbent position, a global network, you've got slots in all the busy airports, you're, you're playing defense. Mm. You know, you're, you're really there to stop the, the new entrants coming in and taking business away from you. But when you go to an airline like JetBlue, uh, you know, you've got to get access to these airports. You don't have the historical uh, traffic rights and slots that have been built up over seven years. So you're playing offense. You know, you're trying to find ways to muscle into markets and mm -hmm. take some market share. And uh, I mean, both of them are fun, but I do think playing offense is a little bit more fun than playing defense. <laughs> so protecting market share versus going after market yeah, share. Yeah, I mean, you know, like we, there were many airports in the US that uh, as JetBlue, we were trying to get into for years and uh, we couldn't get in. And mm -hmm. so then opportunities present themselves, whether it's through other airlines merging, where there's an opportunity to get slots as part of a, a divestiture process, access to gates, and then you, you take them and then you build markets. Mm -hmm. So you had told me that innovation is part of the company's DNA, Robin. Uh, JetBlue was a startup only 16 years ago. Hard mm -hmm. to believe for those who live in New York and mm -hmm. kind of view mm -hmm. it as, as one of the you know, stalwart yeah. options. In what ways is JetBlue still a startup? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, clearly we are now a much more established airline. Uh, you know, and we have 250 airplanes now, mm -hmm. which is hard to believe for those of us that were watching JetBlue get started. But... Um, you know, what we've tried to do is even, even as we've grown to stay innovative. So, you know, in the early days, obviously, it was the free TV in the back of mm -hmm. every seat. And some of those TVs that were put in the back of the seat 18 years ago are still in the back of the seat today. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but, you know, now we've, uh, we're upgrading that. And uh, then just a few years ago, we did free high-speed Wi-Fi, the first airline in the world to offer free high-speed Wi-Fi. And then, uh, you know, Mint, which is, mm -hmm. I'm not sure anyone's flown it, is our premium experience across the Transcom. But I mean, premium fares since we launched that across the industry have more than halved. And, and so, you know, we're always trying to find ways to innovate and uh, be different. And, and I'm, we're going to talk about what Bonnie does in a minute, but that's, a, I think, a great example of mm -hmm. uh, something that we kind of, uh, re where we really embrace technology. And Bonnie, you mentioned this, but you were at JetBlue before Robin came along. You joined the company in 2003. Yeah. Robin joined five years later. How did JetBlue think about innovation and engagement with technology back then versus now? Compare think, and contrast. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Jet, JetBlue has always been innovative. It's in our core. It's in, in our DNA. It's how we think. I, I remember, you know, uh, at previously as, as a pilot, you'd, you'd carry your big flight bag on board that had all those manuals on it. And at JetBlue, you were given a laptop. Mm -hmm. So right, right off the bat, um, we embraced technology. Uh, after 9-11, JetBlue immediately put in cameras, put in uh, armor doors, was the very first one to do that. So very, very safety-minded and very, very innovative-minded right from the very beginning. But I always say, you know, you're only innovative for one point in time, and then innovation moves, moves along. You have to keep up. So it's, it's uh, and especially... Uh, in the last, say, 10 years. Mm. Uh, and so whether it's inside our, you know, launching with, uh, we were the first to launch Apple um, uh, Apple Pay and, you know, did a, did an Apple Watch app. We're the first ones to do that. We do a lot with our, our flight ops. But even then, we still need to pay attention to what's happening, whether it's electric propulsion or blockchain or uh, you name it. Machine learning, we're starting to do a lot in that space. And that's where JetBlue Technology Ventures comes in. All right, so let's focus on that part of the business. Sure. What was the thinking behind the Technology Venture Group, and how exactly did it get started? Did you propose it, or did someone kind of talk about it at a meeting, and you raised your hand well, for it? Well, actually, Robin was at that meeting, so I'll let, let Robin, you can sort of, uh, how did it get launched? Well, I, you know, I think, actually, going back to your last question, because I, I think we started with something slightly different in mind, and then it moved. Mm. So, you know, we, we were definitely... Uh, looking at ourselves and we, we try and be very self-critical mm -hmm. and we say look we've been this all this we've been this innovative company for so long but I, I'm now getting loads of emails and calls and all these people with these cool ideas and they were getting lost in the organization because JetBlue is so busy doing so many things and you know we, I think we felt as a leadership team and as a board that we were in danger of losing that and so we really said you know, how do we create a conduit here how do we kind of put a foot in a world that we know is out there and um, and so we that's where the idea of technology ventures was born. And uh, you know, Bonnie was uh, uh, asked to lead it because Bonnie had great JetBlue experience. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to just go and get someone from the VC world who mm. didn't understand us because my big concern about that 
is we create this island of Bonnie over on the west coast, uh, detached from the rest of the airline, and it wouldn't work because the airline wouldn't embrace it. And so we wanted a JetBlue insider to lead it. Mm -hmm. And then Bonnie hired a team, which you can talk about, that came mm -hmm. from, some of them came from that VC world. And uh, I think it's worked just, just great. Yeah, so I think really it, it started with the concept of, uh, we do a lot of innovation internally, um, but we had to start thinking about innovation from the outside in mm -hmm. without shutting down what's already going on internally. So the idea was to be out in Silicon Valley separate from the airline um, so we can move quick uh, and nimble. But with corporate venture capital, one of the challenges in over the, the history, it's at CVC is what it's called, has a bit of a checkered history. Uh, and often it was because someone from the parent company would go out and start investing but not understand the venture world. Or someone from venture would start investing but not understand the parent company. And the whole point of corporate venture is strategic investments. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand both. So what we did is, um, so I obviously understand the, um, the JetBlue in all different departments. So my prior job was head of talent. So I had the wonderful opportunity to hire most of our officers and directors or do promotions. So yes, I even helped Robin uh, uh, promote into the CEO role. I actually hired my uh, boss. I thought, I thought you tried to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but I did hire my boss uh, as well, uh, uh, Ish Sundaram, who's uh, our chief digital officer. And um, so we wanted, I wanted to have someone who would also understand venture. So the idea was moving out to Silicon Valley and I brought on uh, our managing director, Raj Singh, who has you know, deep connections into Silicon Valley. And fortunately, I'm from that area too. So the two of us then built out a, built out a team. We've since expanded it. So we have an investing side and we have an operating side. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea is we invest. And yes, we want to invest for a return. But it's much more about the strategic value to JetBlue. How can we increase revenues, reduce cost, enhance safety, or improve customer service? Uh, so that we measure, we measure those. And that's how, um, how our portfolio works out. And it's in the end, but that nice balance. So a startup, right now, it's, it's easy for startups to get money, relatively right. easy. Uh, it's, it's a lot harder for a startup to get access to a company like JetBlue. So we give them money and access. And that's the magic sauce. So you mentioned strategic a couple of times yes. in answering that. Uh, how much of the motivation is financial? Um, there's Now, clearly we want to make investments that are wise investments. So we're not going to invest in a company unless we think they're going to succeed and make money. Now, they may not have a quick exit. We're not looking necessarily for the 10x or 100x. Mm -hmm. um, will they provide insights and value to JetBlue? So I might get the 10x in the return to JetBlue as opposed to the return uh, when they exit, perhaps. Um, so but there is a, there's certainly a level of, I mean, the team is incented to make sure we have good financial investments. But if when I go into a room and I'm with other VCs, they're, uh, they're, they're focusing on one, one thing, right? A return. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the return and the strategic value. I would say the strategic value is far more important than a financial return. What, 70, 30, 80, yeah, 20? Yeah, I would say 70, 30. Okay. Do the portfolio companies need to be ones that could potentially partner yeah. with JetBlue or could be folded into what you do? Or do they have to be connected to transportation in any way? Or could it just be a really cool idea that you like? Well, actually, it, that's a really good question. So um, we think of, of Jet. We're, we're here to support JetBlue now. So about 40% of our investments are for d deployment at JetBlue within the next year or two. About 60% of what Jet, JetBlue might be. So the mm. infamous saying, you know, with Wayne Gretzky, we, sp we skate not to where the puck is, but where the puck might be, right, mm -hmm. in the future. So we're looking at five, ten years out, and technologies, you know, w one of the startups that we, we worked with um, early on, they had six people that were coming out of MIT. They had this really cool weather sensing um, product, but didn't quite know what to do with it. We partner with them. They're now, I think they're already on, a, on a, their Series B. They're deploying across... Uh, um, insurance and auto, uh, um, automobiles and uh, um, in uh, outdoor sports and such really real accurate prediction and the teams quadrupled since then. So What's the name of that company? It's a company called Climacell. Mm -hmm. I highly encourage, it's unbelievably accurate weather prediction and sensing because they use cell towers. Think of radar. Mm -hmm. Radar is not all that accurate because it's broad. Th think of how many cell towers there are. It turns out there's these smart MIT PhDs that figured out that the tight that uh, 
cell signals attenuate differently depending on the type and intensity of weather. So they can tell you, tell you whether or not it's raining in New York, that's what a weather radar, but they can tell if it's raining right here versus ra raining two, one block away. Okay, Very so it's different. incredibly localized weather. Very localized, which is important, especially if you think of like the Boston Red Sox use them um, uh, to determine whether or not is the game to be rained out uh. or not. Okay, and uh, some other companies that are customer facing that you've integrated into yes. the JetBlue experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Gladly, you mentioned to me, it's a, a call center, but more than that. Yeah, so um, this is an example. So it, a lot of our startups are in the travel, not just airlines. Okay. So could it serve broadly the travel industry? So an example uh, being Gladly, which is call centers. Now, a lot of industries have call centers, so this is not specific to travel. Um, but when I think what... And how this came about is our, our head of customer support, uh, Frankie Littleford, who's a founder, who actually helped us uh, JetBlue launch voice over IP at home call centers, the first company to do that. So very innovative 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's now? What's next? Well, my daughter, who's 20, she doesn't call 1-800-anything. And she certainly doesn't email. And that was the only way you could contact JetBlue. There's a few, we could do some Twitter direct messages, but you couldn't text, web chat, um, WhatsApp, any of that. And so uh, Frankie wanted to figure out how, how do we engage with our customers the way our customers want to be engaged across all channels. And so we, what we did is we do a 12-week engagement. Uh, we call it an innovation sprint. And we talk to a department leader and say, give us a problem that that is broad enough that we can find 100 startups that might solve a piece of that problem. And then we whittle it down. Uh, and so we did that process with her. We had, uh, I think it was 98 startups, and we, it came out on the, on, the, on the end with a company called Gladly, which is an omni-channel communication platform. So you might call JetBlue, and then uh, an hour later, you might text JetBlue, mm -hmm. and then maybe you, you know, at the end of the trip, you might email JetBlue. It all gets synced together. So then the next time you call, they can see, the, the customer service uh, representative can see your last five flights. Were they delayed? Were they not? They can figure out why you were calling before you even call. It's all streamlined. It's all streamlined together for that 360 view, and that was not possible before. We were the launch customer, and this is the beauty. So we invested. Mm -hmm. We then are the launch customer so we can co-innovate the platform. Then they get to use JetBlue's name to go sell their product elsewhere, and we get upside on the equity. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a virtuous circle, basically. Yes. Um, Robin, talk a little bit about cybersecurity because you're mm -hmm. investing in that, too, and uh, you're currently a customer of one of these companies that you're investing in. So talk about how that works. No, I mean, I think cyber is new for all of mm -hmm. us, and... Uh, I would say that you know it's very interesting when you look at the sorts of things that you're talking about now as a board and what you were doing mm -hmm. five years ago. How much time is now spent on on cyber? And you know it reminds me. I mean, the origins of this industry are in uh, aviation safety, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you go back. I mean, the U.S. airline industry has such a fantastic safety record, but that's not through accident. It's through decades of really hard work and process and really understanding what was driving accidents and, and changing it. And I think I feel now with the early stages of cyber where there yeah. is a very significant threat out there, it's omnipresent, it's every day. And you know, you, know, you have a duty to keep your network and your customer data uh, safe and secure. And so again, I think another example, the, the investment with Shape is being, it came through Bonnie and it's really uh, uh, an innovation in the world of cyber that is also gonna help our, I mean, so just like aviation safety, cyber is a series of you know, defenses, and mm -hmm. there's no one level of defense that protects you. It's that sort of system mm -hmm. of defenses that protect you, and so shape uh, yeah. slots into, into that. Yeah, so I think of this is another example of do we invest in startups in aviation? No. Travel, yes. And then broadly, anything enterprise 2.0. So call centers, you know, every company that has a website needs you know, bot protection uh, and cyber protection. So these are these things, so we'll support it. And then when we get to co-innovate, we get to really go in underneath the hood, and we can test out new product before others can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have a lab, an instant lab for mm -hmm. you. How many startups do you see per year versus how many do you invest in? <laughs> oh, yeah. So these are the entrepreneurs who are always like, oh, I've got this best deal. And then, uh, yes, it's, uh, we typically see, we started out the first two years. This is our third year. First two years, we saw 1,000 a year. Um, and this year, we'll we hit about 2,500. Wow. And I think we'll close the year with 10 startups. So 
Um, now, what's really exciting about that, it's not just the 10 startups. For us, think about the knowledge that you get when you go from 25 to 10. Truly seeing what are the trends, what's out there. And sometimes we'll see a startup, uh, and we keep track of them all, we have a nice database, and we'll see a startup over the course of two or three years. And then once they've really matured, then we might go in and invest. Okay, so, so. you stay, basically you keep in touch with them. Yes. Um, who among JetBlue's leadership, Robin, is exposed to, to these new ideas, the startups that you, you look at and you consider, but you don't necessarily invest in right away? Is there a process for that? Uh, well, um, uh, the, you know, the interesting thing, it's been interesting me watching this from the beginning, right? <laughs> uh, so putting Bonnie in place, getting the team set up, uh, and there were, you know, I'd say definitely leaders in JetBlue, as there would be in any company, who embraced that from the beginning. You know, um, Bonnie talked about Frankie, who's one of our founders. And there were other leaders who embraced it. And I think others were, like, more on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not really sure, mm -hmm. you know, if this is a... Now, I mean, now we have the opposite issue. You know, now we have more leaders going to Bonnie saying, you know, we have these business challenges. How can you help me drive step change in my business, whether it's, you know, lowering costs, enhancing revenue, improving safety improving yeah. service and and it's got to a point where we just can't process all of the uh ideas you know there's i mean as as nimble as we like to be there's so much stuff that bonnie is now seeing and we just you know you've got to be thoughtful about change management sure. you can't just throw it out there and hope it works especially when you're flying 40 million people a year a thousand flights mm -hmm. and so uh bonnie's now built building partnerships with other travel companies other airlines yeah. and other industries so that she can bring to these startups, different types of organization to uh, test their product in. Yeah, What's so the number of requ requests you get from, from the managers, the senior leaders within JetBlue for the problem they want solved? Uh, I, you know, I think a lot of the, it, it, every department though is, it has something different. So we've done, we call these innovation sprints, they're, they're 12 weeks and we've done them from everything from the department leading the biometrics team, you know, we're doing a lot of biometrics at JetBlue, to Benefits, you know, how do you innovate with benefits? And the one that we're currently doing is with our strategic sourcing team. Think of it as procurement, supply chain, mm -hmm. and then some. Uh, and there's, you know, our poor crew members behind the scenes are stuck with just running off of spreadsheets and all kinds of old tools. This, there's so much new out there. They're so busy procuring stuff for other departments, they don't have time to take care of themselves. So we work, we help them. And what comes out of this process is, as Robin was saying, now, these startups, once we invest, they want access to JetBlue. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to meter it, as Robin says, says, I don't want to be bringing so many startups into JetBlue that leaders are going to run the other way, or the IT department's going to run the other way, right? Because a lot of them require IT um, development. So instead, by bringing in an ecosystem, so we launched uh, our first partner is Air New Zealand. Uh, and Air New Zealand now is working with seven of our startups, four of which we're not yet ready to uh, deploy at JetBlue. Different airlines and different companies have different needs, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're long haul, uh, you know, um, long flights. And so uh, they have different needs. So they're deploying. We're looking at um, ground transportation providers, a hotel provider. And uh, we'll build about seven or eight of these um, uh, partners who will uh, co-locate with us in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And then that builds quite the ecosystem for the startups to come in. How much money are we talking about here? So we don't uh, invest, um, we're in the early stages, which is fabulous. So everywhere from seed, series A, series B, we do follow-ons. While we don't publicly disclose the exact amount, it's, it's not significant at all, particularly with a six, seven, seven billion dollar company, but the impact is oversized. Okay, Robin, you deal with shareholders all the time. You get on the conference calls for mm -hmm. earnings. Mm -hmm. How supportive are investors of this endeavor? How aware of are they of this endeavor? No, I, I definitely think uh, we, we, we've had some, uh, you know, conversations with uh, investors about it. Uh, I think to Bonnie's point, uh, in terms of the sort of financial metrics that they look at, it's not that material. I mean, we're a very capital intensive business. I mean, we're spending over a billion dollars, close to $1.2 billion a year on airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, airplane aircraft purchases about 90% of our total capital expenditure. So that's where that's where they tend to focus. You know, how many airplanes are you getting? What's the return on those airplanes? And what we're doing with Bonnie will bring benefit o over time. And mm -hmm. I think once, as we, I mean, we're only two years into this, so mm -hmm. we are now just in the process of like, mm -hmm. we've got the first things that we're starting to see happen. So it's gonna take some time for those benefits to flow through to the 
the bottom line. So we're starting to get questions on earnings calls about, uh, you know, yeah. curious, curiosity, because yeah. yeah. uh, there's, and we're getting more, in, more importantly, I think we're, we're getting a lot of other companies. We have uh, senior leaders, you know, C-level leaders and boards uh, from public companies coming into our office. I'll say every two weeks we have another public company come in our office to learn what we're doing and, and how we're doing it. And take your best practices, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So clarify. You're going to start charging for that, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It's a revenue generator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so clarify for us, Bonnie, how do other airlines do this? I mean, surely you're not the only airline investing in external startups. Do you ever find yourself competing with, I don't know, Delta or American and, and their CVC arm if they have one or something similar to that? Yeah, so I think, you know, everybody has a different way of looking at innovation. Um, uh, in the U.S. airlines, some have sort of innovation departments underneath like either IT or strategy. Uh, some look at it from an M&A perspective. There are a few that do off-balance sheet investments, um, but it's typically within another unit that's not a specific CVC. So there are no other U.S. CVC mm. uh, dedicated units. Um, and internationally, we're seeing a few starting to pop up. IAG has a, um, a, a small uh, version of one, and Qantas has another one. Um, and so we're seeing a few here or there, but no, no competition for us whatsoever. I mean, the nice thing is we're in Silicon Valley. And in, and yeah, why are you in Silicon Valley yeah, and not New York? Well, Triple is uh, a New York-based airline. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. So uh, I think by being, by being 3,000 miles away, it allows us to be creative and different and, and, and move, move quicker. Uh -huh. um, at the same time, it gives us a, a separate set of geography. Now, my team is, I do have members of my team here in New York as well, uh, and we're, we have quite a bit of presence in Boston. So, you know, so our, the team is based in Silicon Valley. We have three uh, here in New York and, and uh, often travel in Boston. I think with Silicon Valley in particular, about 40% of the startups um, that we see are based in Silicon Valley. And so that makes it very easy for us. I'll say another 50% 50 per, 50 of them um, might be, uh, you know, New York is starting to get more in Boston. We're starting to see some in London. I have a team, team in Singapore right now visiting and looking at some startups. But of those startups, like 50% of them, so that covers the 90, actually come to Silicon Valley for pitch competitions. Or, there's such an ecosystem there. Mm -hmm. And we're literally in the middle, just south of San Francisco, just north of San Jose. And so we just, right there, and they just come through our office. Then there's about 10% that we have to go out and scout that mm -hmm. don't ever uh, make it to Silicon Valley. So it's a well-traveled road. Being it's a in, uh, very well-traveled road, and and because we've um, you know we've spread the word of being very fo very founder friendly, very startup friendly, um, we have a nice what we call deal flow. Right. You're still flying, right? Yes. Uh, what kind of routes do you fly in between <laughs> <laughs> looking at investments and speaking with yeah, potential investors? Yeah, so, uh, it, you know, to my, to my core, I'm a pilot. I've been flying for 30 years. Uh, and I, you know, if I'm working for an airline, I, I can't imagine not flying. Uh, and so, yes, uh, I do come out here. I'm out here quite frequently. The aircraft that I fly is only both based on the East Coast, so I fly our Embraer, Embraer 190. Uh, it's a hundred seater, and so the routes are up and down the West Coast, East Coast, I, uh, East Coast up and down the East Coast. I typically, um, lately, like tomorrow morning, I'm flying to, to Buffalo and back. So I do Buffalo, Portland, Maine, Burlington, uh, DC. I just call up the captain, and he or she gets to have the morning off and sleep in, and I fly the plane for them. But you just decide that you want to fly a route, and you call them up, and <laughs> well, I work through our crew, our cruise services, of course. I mean, I have to. There, there's tracking on the whole process, but yeah. Um, so, so how often do you fly a month? Uh, several times a month, at least twice a month. So, wow. There's and still there's still seats available on, on Bonnie's flight to Buffalo tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone likes to buy one, <laughs> www. Actually, the flight's pretty full, to be honest <laughs> with you. That needs to be part of the um, on the website when I when I look at flights. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you've seen some of these startup ideas integrated into the flying experience as well, then. Yes. Yes. And uh, you know, one of them. In fact, it's it's fascinating. We have a we have a fellow on the on the flight uh, operations team who works very very closely with all of our um, technology business partners, particularly with Apple, and he's an active pilot as well. And we ha we found a startup recently. That, in fact, it was it's it's Climacell, and and they can uh, do they can predict uh, in flight turbulence, mm -hmm. and so he can then take it on his iPad and test these things out. Um, on, on his own. So we work very, very closely with the flight. In the end of the day, turbulence is something we, you know, 
uh, we are in-flight crew members can have, have injuries with or mm -hmm. uh, turbulence is something we're very, very, very passionate about. How, how can we reduce it? Particularly with clear air turbulence, you can't see it coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're very focused. Uh, we have a, um, a huge focus on the safety side of things. Okay, so, so working these, with our flight ops department. These are potential problems that need solutions. Is there a startup that you would want to invest in but have yet to get an actual pitch on, an idea that you're just looking for and, and if there's an entrepreneur out there who has the right pitch, you'll, you'll listen well, to it. Well, it's funny. Rob and I were just talking about this uh, earlier today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge believer of where blockchain will go. But blockchain is a platform, just like the internet is a platform. Until you have the applications of it, and cryptocurrency, of course, is an application of blockchain, and that is an area we're looking at. But uh, we're very much looking for, and we've met lots of startups but haven't found the right one, that is building in a... An, a, a true application use of the blockchain that will be viable and useful for us, whether it's uh, whether it's customer facing or behind the scenes. And so, um, 2019, bound and determined to find <laughs> a blockchain startup that that we can actually work with and work with at JetBlue. So, if there's any st any startups out there that have a startup that you believe truly, truly can transform some aspect of our business, business, reach out to us. Robin, how do you see the technology ventures changing over time in five years, in 10 years, um, so that it'll generate a material benefit for your shareholders? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I think um, for the next couple of years, we're very focused on how do we, how do we run a better airline, mm -hmm. uh, which definitely shareholders will start to see. But we also launched this year a company called, um, a sister company called JetBlue Travel Products. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is taking the JetBlue brand and selling uh, and, and identifying opportunities in, in the travel space, so just beyond air, that are poorly served today. And really creating new products and new opportunity. I'm not going to say too much about what that is because we're still working it, but we think we found some you know, segments of the travel industry that are very poorly served and uh, can be disrupted and people would, would love it. Because you know, still, if you're booking a travel trip, it's still very difficult. You know, you've got so many different elements to it and everyone wants to make sure they've got the best deal and there's so much information out there. So I think another area that we're going to see yeah. more and more support from uh, JetBlue Technology Ventures, and in fact the president of that team of uh, travel products, Andres, uh, Bonnie and I, and our head of strategy, Tracy Lawler, were talking to another company this morning in the travel space about whether they want to partner with us in this. And yeah. so I think Bonnie's going to be spending more and more time thinking through you know, what are the startups that would help us disrupt sort mm -hmm. of the travel space beyond just the core right. airline? Of all the people flying JetBlue today, only a small percentage of those are buying anything more from us than just the flight. And we think that's a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, so if you start seeing some investments from uh, JetBlue Technology Ventures that are not airline related, but are travel related, that could be a good signal in terms of JetBlue travel products. So I work very, very closely with Andres Berry on that. And um, it's just a great way, because he's thinking clean sheet. How do you think about the travel experience? And that's great. That's, that's where the startups are disrupting. OK, so that's revenue that could come in the future. Robin, I want to talk a little bit about revenue that's happening right now. Um, as, as we reference, clearly JetBlue disrupted the airline industry with uh, the TVs on the seatbacks, the free Wi-Fi. Much of that, though, is standard practice, having the TV screen on the back of a seat. What's also standard practice, and everyone in the audience knows this, is increasing fees for checked bags. Mm -hmm. um, are there more innovative ways to increase revenue than simply to jack up the price every couple of months, it seems like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could give you the, uh, sp I could give you the uh, speech about that. But no, look, um, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, we're, in a, we're a very capital-intensive industry. You know, margins are tight mm -hmm. uh, and so we want to deliver a great experience for our customers but we have to be focused where we deliver that you know we just c simply can't afford to offer the best in every area and, and so the things that we really focus on are providing a great experience you know our, our crew members we put a lot of focus on service and hospitality the most legroom which doesn't sound like much but actually and a $50 million asset that's flying around, an extra row of seats, which is why you see so many airlines cramming on extra rows of seats. Uh, so you know, we focus on the most legroom, and then we focus on the entertainment platform. So we are upgrading all of our uh, uh, TV systems on the 320. So all of the old TVs are coming out, and new ones are coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the investment in high-speed Wi-Fi, I mean, it's not cheap to offer yet that, yet we decided to 
of that free. So, you know, when I think about JetBlue in the early days, yes, it was the free TV and there were no bag fees, but, you know, we didn't have the most legroom back then. There was no free Wi-Fi. Uh, the True Blue pro Alotti program was not as uh, extensive as it is today. And so it just evolves. And so, uh, you know, we'd still, we have a choice of fares. If you still want to buy a fare that includes a bag, we still have one, but it's obviously more than the one that doesn't include the bag because we want to give people the choice. But that's where we focus. So, you know, we look at... Uh, Things like bag fees and say, look, we need to be competitive in that mm -hmm. area. But but we but if we were to say, okay, we're not going to charge for any bags, then we just couldn't simply offer some of the other things. And you know, the airline that doesn't offer, uh, you know, the other airlines, all different airlines choose different combinations of that to offer their customers. So you know, I'm happy what we have. You know, I think the entertainment we offer is very important to people. The legroom is very important to people. And the, and the service is I hear what you're saying, but it feels like the airlines move in lockstep on a lot of these fees. Uh, do they need to, in, do the different players need to move in lockstep each time there's these ancillary fees, or can someone really afford to do something differently? Is there, what's the risk reward calculation of separating yourself from the pack and, and just doing something completely different? Well, I think, you know, when, um, so when people do their searching for airfares on, you know, a lot of people will go to websites that, that compare the, the airfares. And, you know, I think that there is a, a, a mentality in the industry that if I'm not competitive with what everyone else is doing, then I'm not appearing on that first page of a mm. customer's choice. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to, and there's a lot of research that shows the industry, if you're not on that first page of searches, the amount of uh, clicks, the click throughs that you get is significantly diminished. So, you know, when people are looking for search for flights, airlines want to be uh, com competitive. And so, um, you know, if one airline lowers a fare, then another airline might look at that and say, we need to lower that fare too, because otherwise we're not going to. And so that's why it looks like everyone is moving in Got lockstep. It. But it, I think it's just a nature of the, uh, you know, the industry and, and people wanting to make sure that they position their pricing and their product mm -hmm. to get bought. Another problem, contemporary problem, is volatile oil prices. Yeah. Uh, you talk about how this is a capital intensive industry. You've got the planes, you've also got jet fuel. In early October, the benchmark for US oil, which is WTI, was at its highest in almost four years. Yeah. You fast forward to today, and yeah. it's collapsed, and it's almost yeah. in a, I mean, yeah. it entered a bear market. It's down more than 20% from its recent high, yeah. and today plunged 7.7%. Oil prices yeah. have now fallen for 12 straight days, which is a record long losing streak. Yeah. Jet fuel prices have traced a similar path, but they have not fallen as much. They mm. haven't made those new lows. What kind of impact is this having on, on JetBlue? How do you manage these big swings from something that was up here to now here? Well, look, I remember 2008, and uh, mm -hmm. it was $147 uh, a barrel, and yeah. then it, five months later, it was 35 So <laughs> I'm, I love 15 20% swings. That's nothing. Um, no, look, I mean, I think... But it wreaks uh, havoc, I mean, for you guys. Well, I mean, I think we plan our business uh, conservatively. Yeah. So we plan for, you know, a reasonably high level of fuel any, every year. And so, you know, I, I think that we don't get caught up and behave differently just because oil has fallen sort of 10 yeah. or 15%. You know, we're not running around adding flights. I mean, that's a fool's errand because oil can move. Now, in the old days, airlines used to hedge. Mm -hmm. um, more than they do. Hedging is less common Why? these days. Well, I think there's, there's a sense that um, uh, if oil starts to go up, then uh, you know uh, the, the fares, fares will get increased to offset that. And likewise, you've seen when oil has come down, you've seen fares come down. I mean, you go back 2015, 2016, when oil was lower, you know, unit revenues in the U.S. industry came down. So I think that you, you've definitely seen more of that relationship, uh, and you've seen less hedging. Have you seen any startup pitches that address volatile energy prices or jet fuel prices? Uh, no, I mean, we, we do see now, we are JetBlue Technology Ventures, so we invest in technology, um, mm -hmm. but we've seen a lot of very interesting biofuel mm -hmm. uh, um, companies and startups, and we, were, we have an unbelievable uh, head of sustainability at, at, um, at JetBlue, Sophia Mendelssohn, and we, so we refer to her, and we've done, JetBlue has done some really interesting stuff with, um, with biofuel. So, that's one way of looking at it. And I don't know, I would say that, you know, all airlines, and I know that it be working internally at JetBlue, um, you know, oil prices will go up and down and the economy will go up and down. The thing that we have to constantly focus on is just keeping our costs. So we measure things all X fuel. So all of our costs X fuel as, as a leadership team. So we're managing, if it goes up, um, you know, we might have a few, you know, frowny faces or something, but it doesn't change our behavior. If fuel goes down, 
It's not like we go out and you know, get more headcount or something, right. right? We just have to keep our cost as, as low as possible. All throughout. right, so when you look out, um, obviously oil prices is something that's kind of noise in the background yeah. for you. Um, when you look at what part of the airline industry is right for disruption, Robin, mm -hmm. uh, I know you had mentioned regional travel, mm -hmm. business flights perhaps between sure. the U.S. and yeah. Europe. Yes. Yeah, no. Um, so we, back in 2014, we launched uh, Mint, which was our premium yep. uh, Transcon experience. And when we did that, and it's quite controversial in JetBlue at the time, because that was a big departure from what we were doing. It didn't fit with your brand up until Well, I point? think, you know, our, when, when crew members joined JetBlue, the l thing they learned on the first day at my opening module is how we have to treat every customer really well. Uh, and so we have a very egalitarian culture. You know, same applies for all of us. You know, every crew member, including me, is on the same medical plan. Mm -hmm. uh, no one has a bigger office than anyone else. I mean, we all clean airplanes, work shifts in airports. And so we work very hard to keep that culture. And so here we now, we're saying we're going to create a different cabin and we're going to treat people differently. And so it was very, it was, it was a big debate internally. And, uh, but we saw the opportunity of a market that was poorly served, Transcon, with very high fares and poor service. And so we created Mint. We said, we're going to create the best premium Transcon experience. Mm -hmm. and we're going to curate every single flight, one flight at a time. Uh, and we're going to significantly lower the fares. Uh, premium Transcon fares now are, on average, about half what they were. So we talk about you know fares going up and bag fees. There's also examples of where fares have come down and fares come down a lot. When I look now, when we look to Europe, we see a potential opportunity because fares to Europe to fly in these premium cabins, business class, are uh, obscenely high. And so we see an opportunity to come in and, again, build a better product and a, at a much lower fare and stimulate the opportunity for people to fly in a premium cabin across to Europe. But so all this takes time to plan for and to execute. It doesn't yeah. happen tomorrow. And right. at the same time, a lot of people are saying the economy's peaking, the U.S. is going yeah. faster than other countries. Do you mm. worry that the lead time to get your efforts in place will coincide with some kind of slowdown? No, I mean, actually, you know, what we found back in 2000, uh, 2008, 2009 was that we did better than compared to other airlines because during times of an economic downturn, there is like people look to retreat to value. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to, they want to take a product that has the lowest fare. And so we actually feel that what we're building will be very resilient to uh, the economy, uh, whatever stage that we're in. I'll build on the, the regional travel piece for a second, Please. too. So, um, you know, one of the questions, if you just kind of take a macro step and you step back, and if you were on the, you know, the board of a, a hotel company or an automobile company or taxi company back in 2009, you heard about this company, Airbnb or Uber or Lyft, and you thought they were just crazy. And now that's completely disrupted the, the hospitality industry and the automobile industry. And so one of the one of the thesis or one of the mandates we had is what's going to happen to the airline industry, say, 50 years from now? Will, will airlines still exist? And so well, you'll have to ask me in 50 years if I'm right, but I do believe, yes, you will still be going to New York to find a JetBlue flight to, to San Francisco or wherever. But for very short haul. Mm -hmm. um, regional travel, so think of the regional airlines, so the, so, the, so the express carriers, if you will. They're flying fewer and fewer aircraft to fewer and fewer um, airports, and consolidation is happening where, you know, there's 5,000 airports in the country and only 160 have, have service. So it's, and now there's more and more congestion at those airports. So people are starting to book away from airports, if you will, thinking of buses or, you know, autonomous cars. Well, we do believe that electric propulsion is going to have an impact. So think of the air taxi. So electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. We're also already starting to see marketplaces for corporate charter uh, aircraft because they're very underutilized. You know, we utilize our aircraft at, you know, 11, 12 hours a day. Uh, and the corporate um, aircraft around one hour a day. So it's sitting on the tarmac most of the time. Sitting on the tarmac most of the time. So underutilized. So there's marketplace opportunities, and then there's also entire new types of vehicles, um, the air taxis. It's not flying cars. I mean, flying cars are things where they drive on the road and then fly. <laughs> um, so it's not those type. But not back to the future not, yet. Not, not back to the future. But I, we do believe that by the year 2023, 2024, that that air taxi service. So electric will take off. Will JFK still be the hub then? I mean, you guys obviously, Robin, need to invest in, in making JFK a mm. little bit easier to, to get to and to, mm. <laughs> and to fly out of. Now you're telling me, I mean, to go from my house to uh, JFK is four trains. Um, but um, 
No, I mean, actually, uh, you know, we're now, um, it was announced that we're in uh, exclusive uh, lease negotiations with the Port Authority here in New York to build a new terminal. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to keep our Terminal 5 and we're going to build next to it uh, where the old JetBlue terminal was and then mm -hmm. over where the BA British Airways terminal is now. So it's going to create a really amazing world-class facility. And then, you know, we continue to push for better access to JFK. I mean, it is crazy that we're in New York and we don't have a single seat ride into Manhattan. And it is, it's, it's not easy to do, but, but if there's will and there is alignment uh, amongst mm -hmm. all the different agencies and, and different interest groups, we can get it done. Uh, and um, that, would, that has the ability to transform JFK. You know, if you can get get a JFK and do a one-stop train ride into mm -hmm. Manhattan, then that it would be will. disruption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are big supporters of that. We continue to push that, um, and um, hopefully we can mm -hmm. convince everyone in here to help us do that mm -hmm. too. Bonnie, let's go back to the five goals that you had sure. when you were 14. Um, you mentioned a good school. You mentioned the Olympics, Czech mm -hmm. uh, TV commentator, mm -hmm. pilot. Number five is still not yet complete. That was to build a log cabin. But yes, this Where are you on have that? something to do in retirement. <laughs> uh, yes, the, probably the time. biggest hurdle there is to convince my husband. He says, oh, no, it's not efficient or whatever. And we'll build that log cabin. We will. Oh, yeah. um, He's building it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, that, uh, we're, we're, I'm not anywhere near retirement yet. So it'll be a ways off. But that is something. Um, it is, it, you know, I grew up in the mountains, and I love log cabins. It's just been a dream of mine. So we, it'll probably be a small one be up in a ski area or something. No one's betting against you, given that you fulfilled four out of five. <laughs> I want to thank Robin Hayes, CEO of JetBlue, and Bonnie Simi, president of JetBlue Technology Ventures. Thank you.